Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Resilient Riches. We have Tal Heinrich today coming in live from New York. If you know I-24 News, you've seen the reporters, you've seen the, the hosts. If you see these new wave of Israeli superstars that are coming in and advocating and becoming these spokespeople, Tal is the epitome of what it is in the, in the U.S. So we're so excited to have you. Tal was previously on I-24 News. She was on TBN. Uh, she's been really everywhere, and she really is a powerhouse for Israel. Uh, she lives in New York. She's the she's the ambassador to the, to Israel. She speaks a lot for the prime minister's office and is really on the forefront of what's going on. And I love this shift and how Israel has pivoted and to show resilience, how Israel has pivoted, taking these people and and bringing them on the forefront and bringing them to go and be nonstop. And you see the interviews are doing five, 10 interviews a day, some of them are doing. And it's really, really amazing. So we're really honored to have you on today. Tal, if you can give us a two minute. I don't think the ambassador. I don't think that was the right word. No, ambassador she's the ambassador. To the Israel? Yeah, to the prime minister's office. Am I wrong, Tal? Ambassador, is that the right word? Uh, well, my official title um, in this war is spokesperson for the Israeli prime minister's office. So you are uh, correct, sort, sort of. of. It's just I think I win more than my dad. It could be confusing. It could be confusing. That's all I'm saying. Ambassador to Israel. I mean, that's that's part of it. Somebody else has that job. All right. Tal, tell us, give us a little two-minute background about you, and uh, we'll go from there. So... First, first of all, thank you so much for for having me on your podcast. It's really an honor because I know uh, how much you have been doing for Israel during this war. Um, everyone is mobilized in the country and in the Jewish world as part of this national effort. We are together in this, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder, and we're all united in, in this fight against pure evil. Um, I uh, live in New York. I got called up on October 7th, and I took the very first flight that I could find, the very first El Al flight that left uh, Newark to Israel. Uh, that flight is an experience of itself. It was uh, very moving, very, uh, you know, heavily charged atmosphere. I can talk about it a bit later. Um, and, and I'm a journalist, journalist, news anchor. I, uh, I, I used to report to Israeli media outlets, uh, to U.S. media outlets. And um, when October 7th happened, I, I was in New York and the moment I got the call, I, I just knew I have to do my part. And my part, as well as my colleagues, Mark Regev, who was the former ambassador to the UK and is an advisor to the prime minister and Elon Levy, who's uh, an Israeli government spokesperson. Uh, he also worked with me at I-24 News many years ago, but he also served as um as a President Herzog's uh, a spokesperson in the English language. And all of us, uh, our, our job is to speak to international media outlets and, uh, and do the daily briefings to journalists and, and really tell Israel's story, or rather remind, I think we, we can say, uh, to the world. And it was, um, it, it, it was an important mission on October 7th because uh, everyone wanted to hear what the perspective was like, what it felt like to be on the ground in Israel, what was the national mood, the national pulse uh, in regards to the national trauma that we've been through, but also uh, in terms of the war, a unity government that was just uh, formed, a, a, a war cabinet. But as the days went by, we had to keep reminding people what happened on October 7th and of the 14,000 missiles that, you know, keep raining on our community since the war broke because the uh, global media attention sort of shifted to what was happening on the ground in Gaza. So we keep reminding people how we got there and that everyone would have still been, you know, safe and sound today if it wasn't for Hamas doing Absolutely. what they did. And everybody all the Palestinians across the world would be safe right now and the Jews in the world would be safe right now. But this Muslim Brotherhood and, and ultimate faction of, of the Muslim Brotherhood that is Hamas is a really, really big problem. How is it that your team is is answering the call and how is it that you guys pivoted so quickly into this? I mean, what was that? Uh, you go into a war room situation, but you were doing something else before this or you're doing something that all of a sudden you basically quit your day job and doing your full-time job. How did you make that pivot? We're always ready. We're always ready to speak for Israel. I mean, we have the skill, we have the language, we have the knowledge, we have the historical background. 
and we have the moral clarity, which I think is is the most important thing one should have when speaking on on behalf of a, a, a Jewish state, the one and only in, in the world during a war. So I think we, we we have the set of skills, and we just pivoted very quickly. I think on the technical side, it was also a bit challenging because you know once the war broke. We established the National Public Diplomacy Directorate, uh, and and we shifted it to function in a in a uh, in, in a war period, which means that we have uh, a, a camera position, and we have daily briefings that we need to send out to the world. We need to uh, establish a, a, a list of journalists who, who want to attend the daily briefing, and how we do it technically. Like the the small stuff tend to be the bigger yeah. ones, I think, than the skills that we have as as people but we m- made it happen so so quickly and if you go to the central command in tel aviv then you see our room there from which we do the daily briefings from which we do uh the interviews um it, it's a studio that was set up it's it's a tv studio that we we set up so quickly because we had to answer uh the demand for so many interviews and they said it, you said it right when you presented me uh sometimes it's dozens of interviews per day i think we've done hundreds if not thousands now in the different languages and it's not just us in English you also have the different daily briefings in in various languages happening every day Ophir Gendelman my my other colleague for example is doing it in Arabic speaking to Arabic media outlets uh, doing interviews in Arabic every every day and uh, you have it in Russian you have it in Persian you have it in Spanish and so forth uh, which is you Really impressive because uh, back in 2014 the Israel Gaza war if you remember Tsuke Tan op- operation protective sure. edge um, I was still a desk producer back then for for CNN in Jerusalem uh, CNN International and I remember Mark Regev going uh, running rather from studio to studio back then you know you didn't have zooms and skypes weren't uh, You know with things so you actually the the spokes uh people actually had to move from one studio to another physically and do these interviews and now we're able to do dozens a day um there is a difference though when i do the interviews on set here in new york i think there is also some upside to this obviously there is a there's traffic and and if you go physically from one studio to another it takes you more time but i think there's a value in this because you also get to talk to the producers uh, before and after get the get a sense of w- w- what what the pulse is like in, in reporting the news in the newsroom so there is also a benefit to that but um, our studio in in the National Public diplomacy directorate is is impressive and it's 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 very much different than how we did um, war PR so to say although I don't, I don't no, like it, to call it, it this way I also like to It's, it's, advocacy. Um, it's, it's, ad, it's Jewish advocacy and hum, human advocacy. Where is it? Where is yes. It? I, oh, I'm going to use this definition. Well, I love it. That's really what it is. It's human. That's, I think, that's I think one battle. question maybe that you've already, that you, I'm sure you've addressed and people have addressed is what happened to the Israeli army on October 7th? How come, you know, how do we understand that there was no intelligence or the intelligence was ignored and that this was, uh, this was able to happen? I mean, it's still something puzzling. I'm sure there's going to be many, many inquiries once it's done. But just, just between you and me, just for our listeners, just on a basic level, I mean, you know, they stopped this terrorist, they stopped that terrorist, but yet this was such a massive failure. There was a big failure here. Um, there's no doubt about it. We take pride in our intelligence. We should have been better prepared uh, 100%. And, and you're correct. There are investigations underway. And there will be more inquiries after we accomplish the goal of eliminating Hamas and bringing back the hostages right now the, there's so much focus on the war and uh, you want uh, you know everyone in the country is is very much focused on what's happening on the ground and and, and uh, how we strive to accomplish the the, the very very just uh, missions that we have set forth But, um, we don't want people to being get, getting busy you know uh, getting lawyered up instead of doing their jobs on the ground obviously but um to to to, to your point you know uh, and I think you said massive failure we also have to remember how massive this invasion was it was an invasion it wasn't a terrorist attack it was an invasion of a foreign army of terrorists uh 3,000 terrorists and um 
as you know, I mean, of course, some of these communities, it's 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 heartbreaking. It's it's the job of of the military, it's the job of the country to protect its civilians and to guarantee that they're safe. And if, if there's a breach, uh, you know, the response should be immediate. But of course, uh, there was a failure here. Although we have to remember that uh, many soldiers and, and first responders rushed all of these scenes and, and you had uh, you had so many uh, battles happening simultaneously, which is really unbelievable. We were invaded by an army of three thousand yeah. terrorists. That's that's the best way to put it. And on, on October seventh, you know, I, I'm sure that you've been following. There have been so many stories of of bravery and heroism, and uh, you know, so many soldiers were 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 killed, and 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 policemen, by the way. Um, in, uh, we had yeah, we had the just, parents uh, of uh, Rose Lubin. If you're familiar, the American girl that was mm -hmm. that was murdered in the old city. Her parents came on to our podcast. First, the mom. This first podcast they've done. It, it was like an exclusive podcast. The mom came first, and mm -hmm. then the father came later. And he told us the story. She was, I don't know, maybe maybe 110 pounds, soaking wet in the snow, and she opened up the wow. gate. Of I forgot the kibbutz, but she opened up the gate that normally would take three men. And I served, I served on that border. I knew a lot of the people in Beirut. I knew Kfaraz. I knew all these places because that's where I served. I was, I was, oh, wow. I was a Chayel Boded. And she opened up the gate herself. She let in hundreds of people and closed the gate herself. She then brought and she she was getting shot at by Hamas, and that's she was the reason. And then she gets killed in the old city, protecting her, her country. She saved her boyfriend. People were going up to her father all the time. And it's a, it's a level of leadership that people, it, there's two sides that I see it as there's, there's leadership and then there's vigilantes. And, and in Israel, the vigilantes and people who stand up and protect their communities are leaders. And they're standing up and people are get, and that's really what Israel is right now. They're leaders. They're standing up for themselves. They're going on public. You're being so unbelievably outspoken when you see how many, how many Hamas leaders have gone up or I don't want to call them. How many Hamas losers have gone up on, so on, on international media? Half the time they leave during the interview. So it's, it's a level of understanding that Israel is leading and we're at, these are tough questions that you're being asked and you're responding to them. And yes, it's very easy to say when when Hamas we say oh if they ask Hamas oh how are you doing right now you're it looks like you guys are getting clobbered they go no we're winning like they're all they're just their their mm. their doctrine is to lie when Israel's doctrine is to lead and that's why I've seen such a we've seen and and we've been so honored in this podcast to see this resilience of people across the world. I, listen, I, I agree with you. We are being us asked uh, hard questions. And as a journalist, you know, I had two minutes ago, I was a journalist and that's fine. Bring it on. Please ask us the hard questions because a war is justified. I can answer each and every one of your questions. Hamas are being asked uh, uh, or being pressured, so to say, but not enough uh, being asked the hard questions about. But, but, but again, this is not enough. And you have the international organizations and, and UN agencies and, and so on that are not even uh, asking Hamas the hard questions that we expect them to ask. But you know who's being left outside of this discourse inter in international media? Um, the Palestinians themselves. They're not being asked the hard questions right now. Uh, how did they groom such terrorist monsters? Uh, why do so many of them uh, still support Hamas or support terrorism? Uh, why did they reject every peace initiative since 1937? How come that they're the only group in the world that gets to inherit a fraudulent uh, a title, definite status of, of, of refugee? Um, what did they do with billions of dollars that came in, that funneled in uh, for, for decades? Uh, you know, so there, there are very, very hard questions to be asked, and uh, many of them, unfortunately, are, are, are not being asked. And, and of course, how come so much terror infrastructure and ammunition are, are being found by our forces in almost every house in, in some of these communities in, in Gaza? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a horrible thing. Yeah, these, are, these are tough questions, and they're not being answered. They're not being asked. They're not being asked. Why do you, why, That's, why? 
Why are they not being asked? People don't want to ask these questions. No, why are they? I want to know. They don't want to ask. They don't want to know. Why are they not being asked? <laughs> why are they not being asked? Listen, if if I had my own primetime TV show uh, in English right now, uh, that's the monologue that I would have written. Um, it, it, it's a job of, of, of journalists to ask these questions. It's a job of international leaders to ask these important questions. Um, why are they not being asked? I think it takes courage. It takes courage to speak out for what's right. And uh, so many people out there are just lacking moral clarity right now. It's, it's, it's sad. I mean, that's, that's really the main part. It's just that. To ask what's, what's right and stand up for what's right and not what's trendy. People you know? want to ignore evil. That's all there is to it. They don't. They want to put their head in the sand. They don't want to know what's going on. They don't want to recognize it. They want to go on with their lives, not be disturbed, and not recognize e evil. But we know that somebody that doesn't stand up for it, it just allows – they're as guilty as anybody else allowing it to happen. Yeah. When this, when, when this right. war is over, what is the next stage for you? What is the next stage for, for all these spokespeople? Because how are you going to, I mean, you're going to get bored. You're going to do two <laughs> interviews a day. You're going to be like, you're going to, you're going to have nothing to do. You're going to just go back to being a normal person. Well, it's, it's hard to imagine getting bored right now, but listen, I think there's so much work to be, to be made even after this war. First, you, you know, our, our vision for, 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 for Gaza, for our neighbors is that Gaza has to be demilitarized and de-radicalized. Um, we will have to speak out about that as well um, after the war and, and guarantee that we don't see a resurgence of, of terrorism after we defeat Hamas. Um, of course, we will still have to speak out. I hope that once we eliminate these dark forces that want to take us backwards, um, who are the enemies of peace, I hope that we will see more peace in the region, uh, not just, you know, uh, in what pertains to to our relations with with our na immediate neighbors, the Palestinians, but um, to enlarge the, the the circle of peace that was you know uh, reignited with the Abraham Accords just not so long ago. I think I, I really hope that we can expand this. I would love to speak about that. So there's so much more that we can speak about, um, uh, and and of course, I think how to say it, what we're seeing right now with uh, the pro-Palestinian industry, and, I, and this is how I call it, because sometimes it's not even coming from the Palestinians I like the word industry. Like, yeah, I like that. Industry, industry is a great it. word. Yeah, it's a very good way to look at it. What we're seeing in all of these protests that are not even blaming Hamas, but just pointing at Israel, uh, demanding a ceasefire, a ceasefire when the hostages are still in Gaza, and, and, and a ceasefire that will leave Hamas in power, that you know, keep this terrorist regime and the threats on Israel alive and kicking. Um, I think that they have been pushing this narrative um, for many, many years. You know, they, the, the pro-Palestinian industry has been closing ranks around this false narrative that the Jews came after the Holocaust, they took a land that wasn't theirs, and, and, and they established a country, a Jewish state at the expense of others, which is 100% not correct. Um, right now, we're in the middle of a war. So we are talking uh, uh, specifically about, you know, uh, the justified wars and the, atrocity, the atrocities of October 7th. But to your question, I think that after we're done fighting Hamas and after we're, we bring back all hostages home, we have to close ranks and I'm talking about the Jewish people in Israel and abroad. And we have to unite around our story and, and articulate it to, 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 to the world. Um, we can't be dormant, you know. Um, so, so I think that will be also part of my mission for after the war. To uh, make sure that the Jews are united, standing together and telling the real story, the true story that counters this fake narrative that they have closed ranks behind. Uh, we, we will do just that and we will do it in, in a fabulous Absolutely. way. Absolutely. I, I think there will be, I think the Saudi, Saudi Arabia is dying for peace right now. I think they are, I think they want it more than they've ever wanted it. I think they wanted it personally before when they were talking about normalizing ties. I think they're waiting right now 
to normalize ties. And the rest of the region is going to normalize ties with Israel because they're seeing, oh, Israel's not just this wimpy country and they have a lot of support. They have U.S. support. They have for they have that EU support. I think the Saudis really, really want the. the I think peace. Israel's doing all their job for them. I think uh, everybody's happy to get rid of this terrorist group that that surrounds people. They want to. They. I think they love it that they're getting rid of it, and they don't. It's nothing off their off their back. I mean, they don't get any blame on themselves, and Israel's doing their job. You're bringing up good points, all good points. Uh, you see, uh, when we eliminate Hamas, some some countries out there in the region and outside of the region, whether you know they want to admit it out publicly or or, or not, uh, they know that Israel is also serving their own interests by eliminating terrorist elements and by sending out an unequivocal message against you know terrorism. That's we're in the year 2024. Terrorism should not be accepted. We should not tolerate this, not one more missile on our communities. We have tolerated this for far too long, you know, for more than 16 years with the Hamas regime in power. And, and they brought only bloodshed and, and poverty uh, to the people of Gaza. So uh, what we're doing is actually freeing Gaza for Hamas and also serving the interests, uh, not only of our own security, but of all moderate, uh, peace-loving uh, uh, players in our region. And we're sending a message to all that actors out there that terrorism is a dead end. Egypt, and we will Egypt, not accept it. It will not go unanswered. Egypt tripled the barbed wire that they put on that. You saw that, those pictures. They tripled their barbed wire to make sure that no Hamas could get into Egypt. You know, Egypt certainly doesn't want them. Well, Yes, you know, you speak about borders and, 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 and my thought, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that one week ago, exactly, now I'm in New York City, but exactly one week ago, I was in, in inside a Hamas tunnel in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, very adjacent to the Erez border crossing, by the way, which is the border crossing from which uh, Israeli, Israeli forces and Israeli civilians used to take Palestinian civilians to seek treatment at Israeli hospitals yeah, with right. whatever right. needed. That, border. And, that was my border. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Right. Huh. And from which humanitarian yep. aid used to I've cross in, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've, seen it, I've seen it all with my own and eyes. And they damaged. Big problem. Big. It, it's sad. And, 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 it's sad, honestly, for the for the peaceful Palestinians. I want to live just I said right at the beginning that it's so sad that the, the fruit stand guy who just wants to feed his family is going to is, is going to die. Like that's that's very sad that nobody wants that. It's nobody wants that, but Hamas, wants that Hamas. That's they wanted this war. Right. They wanted everything that's happening now, and they want Israel to take their pressure for their own war crimes, which is absurd. Um, but you know, I I was <clears throat> I'm talking about the the the, the big town tunnel, the the, the one yep. that is like about 400 meters. If you walk uh, from the Erez crossing, you walk 400 meters, and then you walk. 40 meters down inside the tunnel. That's what they allowed us to do. And this tunnel goes on for like four kilometers. I was only able to uh, stand in the first uh, block of it, uh, so to say, because, uh, you know, we have to be safe. But it's good that I saw it because it is so massive. You can drive a, a, a little truck or even, you know, a, a car through it. And w when you're there, you see the pipes, the ventilation, the, you know, how fortified it is with the concrete, with the iron, which is insane. And, and, and you think to yourself, well, this is just one, this is one like tunnel and we're uncovering uh, uh, thousands of tunnel shafts all across Gaza. It's insanity. It's, it's, it's so sick that you, you can't comprehend who, it. Who are these workers? And, and it's really embodiment of a sick ideology of a death cult that seeks to annihilate the, the Jewish state, kill all the Jewish people, and educate according to these standards, um, which is insane. And I was there and I was thinking, you know, so much human effort, resources, yep. money, work, uh, you know, energy was was put in this, which is unbelievable. This is how much they hate us. And this is how much they hate themselves because they don't care about building themselves. They don't care about turning Gaza into, you know, the new Singapore as our leaders wished for them when we withdrew from Gaza in 2005. Um, their priorities are simply, are simply insane. 
They care about obliterating Israel. That's what well, they care to me, about. It's the corrupt and leadership. When I was to there, me, it's the corrupt leadership. And they're all sitting there in Qatar in these big suites, and they have their hold over the people. You need like a rebellion of the people of grassroots to, to fight against that and to say, you know, you look at these people in Qatar, the leaders, and you know, they don't, couldn't care less about the people. So the people have to stand up, and they're not. Yeah. That's – Israeli people will stand up. So we up. certainly hope that after – Right. We, 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 we're starting to hear some of these voices, you know, especially in the north uh, where we already destroyed Hamas as an organized war machine in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. So um, you start hearing these, uh, you know, Palestinian voices speaking out against Hamas. But still, you have to remember that Hamas is not only a military wing and a, a governance body in Gaza. It's also an ideology that unfortunately is prevalent among large parts of, of the Palestinian society. You know, when when they chant from the river to the sea, what does it mean? The manifestation of which we saw on October 7th, it means no Jewish state between the river and the sea. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. And I wanted to tell you another thing. <laughs> when, I was in, uh, when I was in that tunnel, I was thinking, what kind of sick ideology can really drive someone to build this and and like uh, and, and and overlook their own poverty, uh, you know, day to day misery, desire to live a good life? Um, and I was thinking about World War II. You know, the Germans, uh, the Nazis, Hitler. There was a point in the war where they were losing they were getting crushed by the russians by the allies losing the war already but they still kept pushing with the extermination of the jewish people like they didn't take their resources and and reshuffle them and diverted them to the front lines you know of a massive it, it just it, it it wasn't that the extermination of the jewish people was so important to them even at the cost of diverting resources to the front lines you know so that's what I was thinking about as I was st standing inside that tunnel. They want to finish Israel off so badly that they don't care about themselves and their children. It's it's that kind of craziness of a death call that Israel's yeah. dealing with. And that's why it has to be eliminated. Where where is it and and I found it also that and and I love history, and I, I study the Holocaust extensively. I've been to all the concentra concentration camps. I found that, that if is if Hitler did not focus his energies on killing all the Jews at the end, he actually would have won the war. And if and also there was a whole thing with the American industry that if they they created the they Japan ignited the war machine that was America, and they produced so much military gear that. All of a sudden, they found excuses to attack it, to attack Germany, to attack all these countries, the really mm -hmm. these troops that were killing Jews. And once they saw it, they didn't even realize that it was true. <laughs> How are you fighting the disinformation mm -hmm. that's saying that that saying that this never happened? And obviously, who cares about those people? They're not important. But how are you fighting that disinformation? People who just have such rooted denial. And I and I think it goes back to the Hamas ideology, that the Hamas ideology is to kill Jews, Nazi ideology. It's just so corrupt to its core. Right. But how are you addressing this with young people in the in generation? And I say young people because I know people my age that go like, what are you talking about? October 7th never happened. That's an that's Israel Mossad thing. How are you addressing that? And where do you see the future going for the next stages after this war? Because I know you have a lot more work to do, but how do you, what do you see the future? Just before you answer right. that question, I saw one Hamas leader. He claimed it was Israel that hit the, that, uh, that bombed the, uh, the music festival, you know, when he was being interviewed, which is a crazy thing. And one other thing occurs to me also, you know, even let's say, God forbid, it's never going to happen, but let's say they were successful. In, in 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 doing what they want to do i don't want i can't even say the words but they would just have a devastation afterwards it wouldn't help any of those people we've seen like when israel got out of out of gaza yeah. it didn't help the people and i think that would be the same thing i mean this is a delusion they're living under that by 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 accomplishing their goals that it's going to actually help them because it's not it's just going to be more of the same for them so it's a crazy thing listen i i, I agree with you um 
these are holocaust denial level you know c- c- kind of denialism it's 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 the same people that would say you know 911 never happened or 911 was an inside job you know it's this kind of craziness but um to your previous question i think we should distinguish between those people who are just a you know lost case like you 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 can't really they they will say what they want to say you're going to show them uh you know if an israeli woman could speak to them say i i was raped by hamas my friend was murdered by hamas it was oh you're lying you know you can show them all the evidence in the world and i and i am bringing up the example of the sexual violence against israeli women uh because that's where we saw uh a different kind of level of, of neglect and also denial um overlooking by international organizations which really bothered us and and, and that's why we, we've taken action so i think that's a, a good way a good example of how we really addressed it because for two months all these you know un women international organizations women organizations human rights organizations were sort of overlooking this aspect that hamas used rape as as a weapon of war in the year 2023 which is unbelievable despite so much evidence um that we have presented and what uh, uh you know eyewitnesses have said and then we decided the israeli mission to the united nations decided to hold a conference and and cheryl sandberg was there and uh many many uh voices uh flew in from from israel uh people who worked uh to to, to clean the bodies bring them to burial and um uh a police uh a, a superintendent and so forth came all the way to the united nations and and uh and, and victims of, of sexual violence uh like lenore abrigil uh former miss world and they spoke about the hypocrisy uh that was there and only when we announced that we're going to uh throw this uh, conference to to uh to, to make it happen that's when you started seeing some tweets about you know sexual violence and and you and women said we will have to investigate those claims well, what do you mean investigating i mean we we, we gave you all yeah, the evidence um, but where do you where do you, right. where do you see israel but but we were able to change the rhythm of the news and there was so much focus on it with the new york times fantastic investigation into um these incidents of sexual violence against israeli women I think that um you have to know you have to pick your battles right um some people out there you won't be able to convince them you they'll see an israeli woman being raped by a hamas terrorist in front of their eyes and they'll say oh either oh it's not happening or well she deserves it because she's jewish you know she she's israeli them. and she she's jewish them. um yeah i mean you can't argue with these people but what you can do is uh present them in in the light that they deserve to be presented and and convince the people who you know don't want to be associated with this kind of holocaust denial I'm going to call that um so you you can convince the people in the middle you can convince the people like the young minds that really have no clue no. about what happened no. and and about the conflict in general they just you know they they feed off of um uh TikTok videos uh so so you can change their approach you can educate them you can show them you can answer their questions that's what we're here for where do you see the UN next what do you see after after all this cuz the UN has been just horrible UN on the UN has no credibility but, these women but, groups also have no credibility that's just that's, this, they're marginalizing themselves where, where do you see them though where do you see Israel in the world as as a world power where are they going to be sitting after all this destruction and name calling and and bad mouthing israel mm-hmm. what is the next stage for israel and how will they i i don't know if the word is recover but how will they um be looked at after this is over so first the the un bias against israel it didn't start with this war and it didn't start on october 7th uh which is so unfortunate uh and the current secretary general is not even you know he's definitely not doing enough not even calling it out um as previous secretary generals used to um which is again very very unfortunate um israelis have zero expectations from this body 
um, United Nations, uh, United Nations uh, Human Rights Council, the one that sits, sits in, in Geneva. We see how many resolutions are passed annually against Israel. And then when you compare it with the, the amount of resolutions passed against, I don't know, Venezuela, Syria, Pakistan, um, you know, some of these crazy countries uh, out there. And it's it's unbelievable. It's it's either one or zero. And then you have Israel with double digit every year. And must be a lot of work. Um, this must be a lot of work to write to write all this stuff against Israel. Let's be like a serious uh, effort. The chachi they're just chat I think no, I think they just copy yeah, paste chachi- it. I think they copy paste it in recycle. You know what they do? They do they, it's, I, it's I got exactly. the prompt. You ready for the prompt? 10 like Israel, anti-Israel, whatever on ChatGBT make it in 500 words or more and then they pay a premium for like three bucks a month on chat gpt and that's how they're getting it that's then they just keep an- give me a resolution and we have a built-in anti-israel Correct. block in the united nations we'll yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, though, you know? no, no seriously though i think the reason is that they have all of these resolutions is because they think israel is going to listen they know venezuela is not listening they know syria is not listening they, you know Sy- these countries are going to tell them to take a hike they're not going to even pay attention Israel's the only one that says, okay, you know what? Maybe we'll try not to bomb and kill as many kids as we can. We're going to make an effort. So that, that, you know, I think they come up with these resolutions because they think, you know what? Maybe Israel will listen to us, you know? It's interesting. It's a very good point. I would and, say that was probably one of my best points. And again, it's, 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 Ever? it's. No, of this podcast. The, That's your number one point. I like right. that. I learned something from my father today Uh-oh. on that podcast. Uh-oh. Now we're getting serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's, it's the same old Jewish hatred you know it is what it is they say it's anti-israel but it's 100 percent anti-semitism they will not agree but we know that it's the same old anti-semitism just just disguise itself it's in, part in a of different creation way. it's part same of the pig. world it's not going anywhere same pig different lipstick it's not going anywhere part and, of and, the, they, I, and they don't get it they don't get it that for the very same reason that Israel is fighting to defend itself legally in The Hague right now with the uh, vile accusation of genocide by South Africa, we have to defend ourselves in the battlefield in Gaza right now. It's the same story. It's the same story. It's the hatred of the Jewish people. And that because of the lies of South Africa and because of the actions of Hamas, it's the reason why we have to keep pushing and we have to defend ourselves because we will never go back to being stateless and, and defenseless again, subjected to, uh, you know, routine persecution and discriminatory policies. It is what it is. So that's that's Israel's position. It is what it is. They're going to hate us and we're just going to keep going. and We're not going to go backwards. It's it's really the right move. Tal, you are such an incredible person and powerhouse that there's very few really like you and there's a reason why you were you were you number one yeah it takes one I, to know one sorry it's, for you can interrupt you. all day my dad does it no problem <laughs> usually otherwise you never get a word in edgewise no that's know, not if, true tal, if you don't if you don't interrupt you never get a word in tal tal can schmooze tal can hold her own so the lead you you still i mean you gotta look for watch for your opening and jump in quick <laughs> but um where, where, how did you, before you were risen into this position, what is your background of your defining moment that taught you this resilience? Because the podcast is Resilient Riches, and we want to really know where you get this from because there's so many people that are looking to you as a leader, and I think your values and who you are as a person can really resonate with people. So what would be that defining moment in your life? And it's and and also, if you took one value, one true value that's that spoke to you as a human being, what would that be? So first, the defining moment. The second is is one your one value that really you lead by, and you wake up every single day, and you this is this is your identity. I think the the second question is the easier one for me to answer because this one value is liberty, one hundred percent. It's beautiful. Liberty. Um, and uh, by the way, this is why I also, uh, by part, I mean, I, I, I'm Israeli and I, I say that I'm American by ideology, uh, not by passport, not by nationality, but I feel very much American by ideology after living here for six years. But also, um, you know, there's a reason why I wanted to experience living here um, because liberty is is a huge, I mean, it's, it's the most significant part of the American national ethos. 
you know, uh, you grow up Jewish. You read the Haggadah every Passover, and it is what it is. It's 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 liberty. It, it's liberty, and in so many different senses, uh, you know, I, I'm an advocate for liberty also on, on the economic part. But it's a, it's a whole different story that we shouldn't dive into. Oh yeah, right we're all for it. We're um, yeah yeah we're resilient witches. We're all for the money <laughs> side. No, do not worry. We are pro. We are pro freedom. <laughs> you are on, on the side of, of financial Correct. liberty as well. But I think the Jewish people understand why we must live free, am uh, freely in our own state, um, many, maybe better than anyone else, uh, I, I think, because we've been persecuted for so many years, so many years. You know, and, and it's it's unbelievable that we have to explain why we want to be free to live in our ancestral homeland for some 3,000 years, you know? Um, so many other countries are out there that, you know, gained their independence in so many different ways. Um, and yet we have to explain our path that is so old and and so justified uh that is really unbelievable uh as for a defining moment i'm not sure there was one defining moment but from a very very young age uh i think it was my identity was important to me and my identity is is jewish israeli and of course a zionist you you can't have one without the, the the other two, or fortunately, sometimes you can, but it's like it's like a bug in the system if if, if you have it. Because what does Zionism mean? It means that the Jewish people have an undeniable biblical historical connection to their um, ancestral homeland. Uh, so I think I just grew up like like you in in a house that um, w w with a family that understands these the importance of 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 these values and and these concepts and what happens if if we don't hold on to them um and i think especially after october 7th more people than ever realize that definitely and 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 it's i know there is a defining moment in there but i think also you standing up for women's rights has been something in your life that something has happened to you uh, is that something that Am I feeling accurate on this? I'm, I mean, just the story of sexual violence on October 7th has, has touched me as, as an Israeli woman also on so many different levels and the denial out there and the overlooking out there. And, you know, I, I had the honor to MC that event at the United Nations that I was talking about earlier, the conference that we, that we uh, uh, created in order to um, make sure that it, it gets the awareness that it deserves to get because it wasn't getting the awareness. And I said there in, in my opening remarks that started, the, that kicked off the conference, that some of these women were murdered two times. The first time when Hamas terrorists raped them, sexually mutilated them. And the second time when they put a bullet in them, sometimes, or, or stabbed them, according to accounts, this was happening simultaneously. They were already dead when they still perpetrated these sexual offenses um, against them. And what I said is that we will not allow for a third murdering of these women to take place through neglect um, and, and through silencing. So I think it's our moral duty to them. It's amazing. Tal, you're an inspiration Thank across you. the world. You're an inspiration to us. I, I get chills listening to you. Um, how, how can people find you? How can people get involved? Um, what would be your call to action for our listeners and for people that care about you that want to hear more from you? So first, thank you so much for everything that you're doing um, and, and the people who watch you and, and the people who donate and the people who pray. Everything counts. You know, Israelis are feeling this on the ground. Our soldiers on the front lines are feeling this support on the ground. If it's, uh, you know, spiritual support, 
uh, is support on social media or, or material support. Every little thing counts. If you just speak to one person, if you, uh, you know, uh, outside of the community or in the community, if, 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 you, if you speak out, if you speak privately, if you like something on social media, if you donate, if you pray, it all counts and it's all making a difference. You have to understand it. And Israelis know that if they're running to shelters in Israel because there's a, 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 another missile barrage, they know that Jews in this country and in other places around the world are like in spirits running to shelters with Absolutely. them. Uh, and, and if we are united in this, um, nothing, nothing can win against us, really nothing. There's a reason why we survived for thousands of years, despite all the obstacles and all the persecution and, 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 and the genocide, um, there, there, there is a reason, there's a purpose, there is a meaning in, in, in why we survived and how we survived it. So it's important to remember it. So everything that you're doing counts. And um, we also have to remember that, yes, the PR war out there is challenging and every like and every retweet on social media counts, but we're not fighting this war to get likes on social media and, and better, you know, acknowledgement of, of what we've been through out there. We're fighting to survive. It's it's a life or what death happened? issue for us. And it's real. The threat is real. So that's also important to remind. Tom, thank you so much for coming on. Um, what I learned most from this podcast is really the values that you have. It's it's you will fight to show the world freedom and to show the world that we will stand up and we will advocate for the people who who think and want to be live a beautiful life and live a good life. And we need people like you on the front lines. And we really appreciate you doing it. Um, there's been we we had people on all the time and they're they're advocating, they're talking on social media, and they get message after message, hate message after hate message. But what we said to our listeners and to people who 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 care is send love messages and, and we're sending our love message to you and we really appreciate it. And we want to, we you. want you to keep going forward. And I know that you're sending it back to us to keep going forward. And, and I can't speak highly enough about you. I've been watching you for a long time. So I feel like I'm talking to my maybe, celebrity. Maybe this is the advocacy. I mean, obviously state of Israel, but advocacy was always what was which missing in the second world war. You know, maybe if we had someone to stand up for ourselves in, in a united way, in a strong way, like what we're seeing, maybe that would have helped a little bit. And Who you, knows? Yeah, and you're turning people for us. So um, for all of our listeners, yeah. You know, the, the most important thing is that if we had the Jewish state, the state of Israel, this would have never, never happened. Never, and we'll never let it happen again. Never is now, and it's actually not happening. Exactly. That's the beauty of it. When people say, oh, it's happened again. No, it's not happened again, because now we're standing up for ourselves. It's a mm -hmm. big difference. Exactly. Um, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Your thank success you. is amazing. Uh, we appreciate you. Thanks, everybody, for coming on. We'll see you at the next one.